Good evening and welcome everyone to this evening's with genetics webinar. My name is Gladys Pryor and I'm the senior community relations and special events associate. So tonight's presentation is called Marfan syndrome current cardiac management and new research update. This series is sponsored by the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. For interpretation to Spanish, please click on the language button. Simultaneous interpretation is possible thanks to Margarita Gibbler. We also want to thank our donors, Genetics and Genomics Services, as well as Na Nancy Parkhurst. We are so grateful for their support and welcome yours as well. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the very end of the program, and please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. But for now, I want to please welcome tonight's moderator, Certified Genetic Counselor, Amanda Gerard. So my name is Amanda Gerard. I'm a genetic counselor at Texas Children's Hospital, and I'm a member of the planning committee for Evenings with Genetics. So I'll be moderating tonight's sessions um, where we'll have two speakers, one genetic counselor and one patient advocate. And that'll be followed by a Q&A session. So for the Q&A session, you can enter questions for the speakers using the Q&A function in Zoom. You can enter those at any point during the seminar. And we'll be able to view those. And then at the end, um, we will answer questions during a Q&A session after both of the presenters have spoken. So I'll introduce both of our speakers for tonight. Um, our first speaker will be our provider speaker, Taylor B. Croft. Taylor serves as the lead genetic counselor for the Heart Center at Texas Children's Hospital. She obtained her undergraduate degree in genetics, cellular, and developmental biology from Arizona State University in 2013, and her master's degree in genetic counseling from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, UT Health Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences in 2018. She then joined Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital as the first genetic counselor within the pediatric cardiology department, where she has worked alongside Dr. Shane Morris and colleagues to develop one of the largest cardiovascular genetics programs in the country. Taylor specializes in diagnosing both pediatric and adult patients with genetic aortic conditions, including Marfan syndrome, Loewy's Dietz syndrome, and related connective tissue disorders. She's actively involved with the Marfan Foundation and contributes to research, which aims to improve the management and outcomes for these conditions. Our second speaker will be our patient advocate speaker, who tonight is Mandy Shaw. Mandy is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin with almost 14 years of experience in child welfare. She's a single mom to nine-year-old boy girl, girl twins and was widowed at the age of 27 due to complications from Marfan syndrome. Since then, her son has also been diagnosed with Marfan syndrome, and she's become a fierce advocate to provide awareness for Marfan syndrome and the importance of funding for research, education, and community support. Once again, um, feel free to put any questions that come up into the Q&A, um, and with that, I will turn it over to Taylor. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Actually, before we get started, um, I just wanted to say that my, my hope with tonight's talk is to give you a unique view of the management of Marfan syndrome from the perspective of a pediatric cardiology team. Um, but one privacy note I wanted to make before starting is that any pictures used in my slides are not clinical images from Texas children's patients, but were obtained from the Marfan Foundation's website and social media unless uh, otherwise specified on the slide. So I'm going to start off with a general overview of Marfan syndrome. This is the most common uh, condition in a family of similar genetic disorders called connective tissue disorders. So these are conditions which affect the, the tissue and the proteins that are in charge of holding the structures of the body together. Our connective tissue is made up of many different proteins, uh, but the most common ones you may hear about are um, ones like collagen and elastin, uh, both of which are very important for providing structure to things like our tendons, our ligaments, eyes, bones, blood vessels. It's the, the structure that holds all of those um, parts of the body together. Marfan syndrome is estimated to occur in about one out of every 5,000 people in the general population. And it's caused by a genetic change called a pathogenic variant or mutation in the gene FBN1. 
I think it's helpful uh, to imagine genes like their recipes or instructions. So the FBN1 gene gives the body the recipe needed to create a protein called fibrillin 1. And this is another protein which is really important in the, in the connective tissue. And it helps give the, that tissue the elasticity needed to function properly. But if there's a spelling error in that recipe, which we call a pathogenic variant, then that changes how the fibrillin 1 protein functions and causes the symptoms that we see in Marfan syndrome. So from a genetic perspective, Marfan syndrome has an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. So what does that mean? So typically, we all have two copies of the FBN1 gene, one from each biological parent. And when a person has a pathogenic variant or spelling error in just one of their two copies of the FBN1 gene, then they will exhibit features of Marfan syndrome. When that person has children of their own, they will pass on half of their genetic information to each child, including just one copy of that FBN1 gene. So there's a 50% chance they will pass on the copy with the pathogenic variant and a 50% chance they'll pass on the other copy. In, in simpler terms, with each pregnancy, a person with Marfan syndrome will have a 50% chance of having a child who also has Marfan syndrome. One very important piece of information I always want to emphasize, especially to our newly diagnosed families, is that the life expectancy for someone with Marfan syndrome can be completely normal as long as they are aware of their diagnosis, they're receiving their routine medical care, and they're quick to get medical attention if there's ever an emergency. So these are some of the hallmark features of Marfan syndrome, but something important to keep in mind is that uh, there is a very wide spectrum of features that we can see from one individual to another. So this is even true among members of the same family, where some relatives may have more severe features or more mild features uh, than their relatives. From a heart perspective, the most common features we see are aortic dilation, aortic dissection, and mitral valve prolapse. And it's these features that are the most high risk medical problem in Marfan syndrome, particularly because the risk to have an aortic dissection is 250 times higher than the general population. I'll cover more information about these features in a few slides. Um, some other common features we see in, in the musculoskeletal system include being very tall, having loose joints, very long fingers and toes. You can also see flat feet, scoliosis, very long arms, um, and then a, a sunken or asymmetric appearance to the chest, and as well as uh, something called hind foot deformity, which is an abnormal turning in of the ankles. Common features, um, facial features include flat cheekbones, eyes that are deeply set and slant downwards, and a small chin. And from an eye perspective, we also pretty commonly see nearsightedness or myopia, um, and dislocation of the lens in one or both of the eyes. So typically when a person uh, is being evaluated for Marfan syndrome, they'll undergo a detailed physical exam to evaluate their score on the chart here on the right, which makes up something we call the Marfan syndrome systemic score. And when we're assessing the systemic score, uh, you receive points for each feature that you have and a score of seven or higher meets one of the criteria needed for a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. There were guidelines published in 2010 called the Ghent Diagnostic Criteria, which provide a systematic way for us to diagnose Marfan syndrome. And the criteria is a little bit different for those who do and do not have a family history of Marfan. So if you, if you don't have a family history, you need to meet a, a specific combination of two criteria, um, which includes aortic root dilation, lens dislocation, one, uh, one of those pathogenic variants in FBN1, or a systemic score of seven or more. But if you have a close relative who already meets those criteria, then you yourself uh, only need to meet one criteria. Again, either the lens dislocation, uh, increased systemic score, or aortic root dilation. One important thing that's really important for us to keep in mind in the pediatric setting is that children will always meet this criteria. And this is because the features of Marfan syndrome can develop and become more prominent over time, especially after puberty. So before I dive into how we monitor and manage the cardiac features of Marfan syndrome, I thought it would be helpful to review some important details about the heart and the aorta. So here we have a picture of the heart. And in Marfan syndrome, we're mainly concerned with the left side of the heart, which is pictured in red. Uh, when freshly oxygenated blood returns from the lungs, it enters into the left atrium through these veins and then flows through a doorway called the mitral valve and then into the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart. 
So when the heart beats, blood is pumped into the aorta, which the, is the main artery that delivers our oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. The main heart problems that we see in Marfan syndrome involve the aorta and the mitral valve. So this is a zoomed out view of the heart and the aorta. And you can see here that the aorta first carries blood upwards towards the head and neck, and then curves downwards to carry blood to the abdomen and lower body. And in Marfan syndrome, we see the highest risk for aortic dilation and dissection in the thoracic aorta, which is the portion of the aorta located in the chest. Here's a zoomed in view of the thoracic aorta all by itself. And at the very start, we have um, the aortic annulus, which is where uh, the aortic valve lives. That's the doorway into the aorta. And just above that, we have the aortic root, which is uh, sometimes you'll hear called the sinuses of Valsalva. And this is where we most commonly see the dilation in Marfan syndrome. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like in the next slides. Uh, but one important thing to notice here is these two small vessels coming off uh, of these two sinuses, these are the coronary arteries, um, and these help give oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself, so the heart, the heart can keep pumping. After the aortic root, then we have the ascending aorta, which then forms an arch with these branching vessels that feed the head, neck, and arms, and then finally we curve uh, downwards into the descending aorta to feed the lower body. A helpful thing to know is that the aorta itself is comprised of three separate layers, including in the inner, middle, and outer layer. And remembering the exact names of these layers, um, it's not as important as remembering the fact that these layers exist, and they come into play when we talk about aortic dissections in a few slides. Another thing to be aware of is that you may often hear the terms aortic dilation and aortic aneurysm used interchangeably. And they do essentially mean the same thing, but we tend to prefer the term dilation, especially in pediatric clinic for two reasons. Uh, firstly, when many people think of the word aneurysm, they often think of these saccular type aneurysms where there's an outpouching uh, coming off of a blood vessel. But in Marfan syndrome, this is not usually the case. Um, we most often see something called a fusiform aneurysm where there's a very symmetric enlargement or dilation of the entire vessel. Another reason we tend to say dilation uh, is because the term aneurysm also comes with a, a pretty strong connotation that the vessel is at an immediate risk for tearing. And this can become true uh, in, in cases of people who are getting older and have very large aortic sizes, but aortic dissections are extremely rare in childhood, even in, in children who have Marfan syndrome. So we feel that dilation is a more accurate description. So here's a look at what thoracic aortic dilation can look like compared to the normal aorta. Dilation can happen anywhere in the aorta, but the most common location of the dilation in Marfan syndrome is at the level of the aortic root, like you see here. Um, there are other conditions where we can see dilation of the ascending aorta like this, um, but this isn't always seen particularly in Marfan syndrome. One important distinction to make is that when you hear the term dissection, this doesn't mean a rupturing open of the entire aorta, but uh, really it's a tear within the inner lining or those layers I was talking about a few slides ago. So dissections typically involve a tear of the inner layer, which results in blood leaking into the middle layer. And so this causes the separation between those two layers that creates two different routes for blood to take through the aorta, um, either the true lumen, which is the normal route that blood is supposed to take, or the false lumen, which is the newly created route caused by the tear. And it's type A dissections that start here in the thoracic or the ascending aorta that are the most immediately life-threatening. Uh, this is particularly because they block the flow of blood through the coronary arteries that are attached to the aortic root. Um, and because of that, surgical repair is needed emergently for anyone that has a type A dissection. Type B dissections are less immediately life-threatening, but they do still require medical attention and surveillance. And these are the dissections that start in the descending aorta, so they're not directly impacting those coronary arteries, um, but they can extend all the way down into the abdomen. And if they're severe enough, a type B dissection might also need some type of repair. 
Lastly, Marfan syndrome does have an increased risk for a full aortic rupture, which is a tearing of all three layers of the aorta. And this allows blood to escape out of the aorta and start to fill the chest cavity. And as you can imagine, this is an extremely life-threatening event that requires immediate medical intervention. Um, but again, uh, these types of events are extremely rare in children with Marfan syndrome. The other finding I wanted to show you is uh, mitral valve prolapse. Remember that the mitral valve is the doorway between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And typically this valve is supposed to close in a very secure V-like shape, um, like you see in the picture on the left. Uh, the valve shouldn't cross back into the left atrium and it should not allow blood to leak backwards through the ventricle into the atrium. But when there's mitral valve prolapse, um, this means the valve is bowing backwards into the left atrium, which can allow blood to leak backwards more easily uh, through the mitral valve with each heartbeat, um, which can cause some additional complications and symptoms if, it's, if it gets really severe. So once we've diagnosed a person with Marfan syndrome, how do we help take the best care of their heart and their aorta? Typically, we follow our patients in pediatric cardiology either once or twice a year. As we're getting to know you uh, the and the tra trajectory of your aortic growth, we see you every six months, and then we space the visits out to one year if things are looking uh, more stable. All patients usually have uh, cardiac imaging or uh, imaging of their heart before their visit with the cardiologist. So in childhood, we usually do this with an echocardiogram, which is just an ultrasound of the heart. Um, but occasionally, uh, especially if a pediatric patient is close to needing aortic surgery, we might instead do a CT or MR angiogram um, just to get a more detailed three-dimensional look at their aorta. And then in adulthood, a yearly MR angiogram is the standard of care rather than a yearly echo. Uh, importantly, we have several goals for each follow-up visit. So this includes measuring the aortic dimensions and keeping track of the trajectory of aortic growth. We also monitor for worsening valve problems, uh, such as leakiness, which you might hear your doctor call regurgitation or insufficiency. The doctor may also change the patient's dose of medications based on their current height and weight, or if they've suddenly had uh, some rapid aortic growth. And lastly, we make sure the patient is referred to the surgical team if they're uh, nearing the threshold for aortic surgery. So this is one of the most important echo images that we obtain from our patients with Marfan syndrome. The fancy term for this is called the parasternal long access view, which is just an ultrasound image taken at the angle you see here. So this takes images along the longest axis of the heart and gives us a really good view of the left atrium, left ventricle, uh, mitral valve, and aortic root, kind of all in one image. Here's a snapshot of what those ultrasound images look like. Um, and I know it can be hard without formal ultrasound tra training, which I also don't have to tell exactly what you're looking at. So I, I've included uh, an illustration of the heart in the on the left in the same view that we see the ultrasound picture on the right. Reading the image in the order that blood flows, we have the left atrium, the mitral valve, and the left ventricle. Um, and when the heart squeezes, blood is sent this way out of the heart through the aortic valve. And then at the start of the aorta here, this bulbous portion is the aortic root, which then pinches in at the start of the ascending aorta. Again, here's the same view of the heart, this time showing exactly where we take those measurements of the diameter of the aorta each time we do an echo. So we measure at four important positions with position one being the aortic valve, position two uh, is the aortic root, Three is where we have the sinotubular junction, and four is the beginning of the ascending aorta. And this is just a quick look at how that looks on ultrasound. So once we measure the aorta, then what do we do with that information? The first thing we do is plug those measurements into an algorithm or calculation that gives us something called a z-score. And um, if you have ever taken a class that covers statistics, I'm hoping this picture looks a little bit familiar to you, but this is a standard bell curve, and it's the best way to understand the information that a z-score gives us. Essentially, the z-score is similar to uh, a standard deviation, and it can tell us at what percentile the aorta is measuring compared to other children who are the same age, sex, height, and weight. And it's, it's pretty similar to the growth percentiles your pedi pediatrician may use to track your children's height and weight. 
So a z-score of zero means that you are at the 50th percentile on the bell curve, which is another way of saying exactly average. And a score of two or higher means you're above the 98th percentile, which is another way of saying much higher than the average. And once you reach a z-score of positive two or higher, you're considered to have aortic dilation. So in pediatric cardiology, we use the z-score categories here to help clarify the extent of someone's aortic dilation. So like I just mentioned, uh, from uh, 0 to 1.9 is average. A z-score from positive 2 to 3.4 is considered mild dilation. 3.5 to 4.9 is moderate. And anything above 5 is considered severe dilation. Uh, it's most important for us to pay attention to the trajectory of the z-score over time. And this is because children are constantly growing and it, it gives us a way to compare their aortic root size to the size of their body. And so the z-score trajectory is the best way for us to monitor the rate of the aortic growth over time. And the reason why it's helpful to know the rate of aortic growth over time is because it allows us to see how successfully our medication is working to slow down that rate of aortic growth. We'll talk more about medications on the next slide, but the goal of treatment with medication is to decrease the rate of aortic growth so that the z-score can normalize over time. And you can never actually decrease the size of the aorta. So once you reach a size of 2.7 centimeters, for example, you can't shrink that back down to 2.4. And you also can't completely stop a child's aorta from growing. It's actually supposed to grow as they grow. The goal of medication is just to prevent the aorta from growing faster than the child's body grows. Uh, so it's like we're, we're trying to help the child grow into the size of their aorta. Keep in mind, like you're seeing on this graph here, the z-score in red can decrease even when the centimeter dimension in pink increases, as long as the child is also growing in size and their aorta is not gr growing disproportionately fast. Like I mentioned, the main goal for medications is to slow aortic growth in order to delay or completely prevent the need for aortic surgery in the future. So uh, there are two different types of medications that we use to slow aortic growth. These are called beta blockers and angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs for short. They're, these are two different classes of blood pressure medications. And what's interesting is we still don't really well understand exactly how either of these medicines act to slow the rate of aortic growth. And there's also still quite a bit of debate in the scientific literature about which, if either of these medications is better. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But one of the most common beta blockers used in our clinic is atenolol, and the most common ARB is losartan. And typically, these medications are started as soon as a uh, diagnosis of Marfan syndrome is confirmed, even if the patient has normal aortic dimensions. So I won't go into too much detail here or else I'll start to run out of time, but these are some of the important articles that were published to help uh, guide how we treat aortic dilation in Marfan syndrome. There's several papers, uh, some of which had conflicting data to one another about which, uh, what, about whether it's better to start treatment with ARBs or beta blockers first. But the most important take home message is that both, type of, both types of medications help slow aortic growth. And there's no real published guidelines yet confirming exactly which medicine should be the first line treatment. Uh, so in general, you'll see providers in different areas of the United States and around the world uh, with differing practices. But at Texas Children's, uh, uh, at least on our CV genetics team, our, we tend to start patients on beta blockers first and then add on an ARB as a second medication if we continue to see rapid jumps in aortic dimensions. So one of the biggest topics at the top of our patients' and families' minds once they get a diagnosis um, is sports and physical activity. There are published guidelines from the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology that provide activity restrictions for patients with aortic dilation. But in the pediatric setting, we usually don't start strictly enforcing this until late middle school age when sports tend to get more competitive and children start to push themselves more aggressively in training. Once they reach eighth grade, we start to restrict them from uh, competitive contact sports, heavy weightlifting, and isometric exercises. So th those are things like planks, wall sits, push-ups, pull-ups. And instead, uh, we, we try to steer them towards non-contact sports, uh, things like golfing, bowling, fishing, hunting, or uh, mild to moderate aerobic activities like swimming or light jogging. And if they do want to lift weights, we limit the maximum weight depending on their size. Uh, which is generally not above 20 to 30 pounds for teenagers. And then we encourage them to do sets with uh, low weights and high repetitions. 
When they're young, uh, we feel it's really important to help encourage parents to let their kids just be kids. Uh, but we also want to encourage them towards activities that the children will be able to continue throughout their lifetime. One thing that we have to be really careful about when we're having these discussions about activity restrictions during a cardiology visit is that parents and children might instead hear that they're restricted from all physical activity, or sometimes parents feel so protective that they would prefer to have their child stay away from uh, all physical activity. So it's really important for us to emphasize that we're not enforcing a restriction from everything, um, and being a couch potato can be just as bad for your heart health, um, especially as you get older. This brings us to um, conversations of what sports and activities are considered healthy and safe for patients with Marfan syndrome. And these are the official recommendations from the Marfan Foundation. Um, they recommend that you stick to activities within the light to moderate categories here. And you can see that a, a lot of these activities are acceptable if they're done in a leisurely manner, uh, things like walking and biking. And then uh, several sports in a recreational setting with friends tend to be good options, things like swimming, dancing, doubles tennis. And the practical rule of thumb that we always give patients in our clinic is that as long as your physical output is low enough that you can still have a conversation with the person standing next to you while you're doing the activity, then it should be safe for you to do. Um, so tonight, I also briefly wanted to cover the topic of aortic surgery in Marfan syndrome. So the term prophylactic surgery refers to surgery that we do before there is a problem or complication like aortic dissection. And there are guidelines, again, published by the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association that give us uh, these th surgical thresholds, which are the re recommended aortic sizes that a patient should consider having in an aortic root replacement. So these recommendations were developed by calculating and weighing when the risk for an aortic dissection outweighs the, the risk for an adverse event due to surgery. And these thresholds are based not on the Z-scores that we talked about earlier, but the true aortic size in centimeters, as you'll see listed in the middle column. Um, so the dimension for intervention is above five and a half centimeters for anyone in the general population, while for someone with Marfan syndrome, the threshold is lowered to five centimeters, um, given the 250 fold increased risk for dissection. This is a brief overview of the types of surgeries we have at our disposal. Um, first, we have a total root replacement. In this surgery, the dilated portion of the aorta and aortic valve are completely removed and replaced with a Dacron graft, which is just a very strong synthetic polyester fabric. And then a mechanical valve is sewn to the end of the aorta that attaches to the heart um, in place of the old aortic valve. There are pros and cons to every type of surgery, and in this case, the pros include the fact that this procedure has been used for more than 30 years, so surgeons tend to have a lot of experience with the surgery, and there tends to be very few complications after the surgery. And the other bonus is that the repair usually lasts for the person's lifetime. On the other hand, uh, the cons include the fact that mechanical valves are at a risk for creating harmful blood clots, and they tend to be more susceptible to infection. And, and very importantly, a patient with a mechanical valve has to take blood thinners for the rest of their life, um, which can cause an increased risk for excessive bleeding. The other common procedure here in the United States is called a valve sparing aortic root replacement. Uh, similar to the last surgery, the dilated portion of the aorta is removed and replaced with a Dacron graft. Uh, but in this case, instead of a mechanical valve, uh, the person gets to keep their native aortic valve. The pros of this procedure is that there's no risk of clotting from the native aortic valve and therefore no need to take blood thinners. And there's also less of a risk for infection, but no surgery is without cons. So in this case, the procedure is a lot newer. So surgeons tend to have less experience compared to the total replacement. And there's also less data about how long this repair usually lasts. So patients may actually need to have another surgery if their aortic valve fails. And one thing to keep in mind is the surgery is not available in all parts of the United States, and it might not be an option for all types of patients. There are other types of aortic repairs that we don't have time to go over tonight, um, but these are not yet clinically approved for individuals with Marfan syndrome in the United States. So one of the last major topics we reviewed during follow-up visits is emergency planning. 
So while aortic dissections, again, are extremely rare in childhood and we don't want to scare families, being familiar with the warning signs and having an established emergency plan really is the key to getting immediate life-saving medical care in the event that there is an emergency. It's really important to be aware of the signs and symptoms associated with aortic dissection, which can include sudden severe chest pain that can also be felt in the neck or upper back. I've also had people describe to me a tearing or ripping sensation and sometimes a gushing feeling. And other common symptoms can include low blood pressure with a rapid weak pulse, shortness of breath, loss of consciousness, and stroke-like symptoms, things like vision problems, difficulty speaking, weakness, or paralysis. If someone with Marfan syndrome experiences a persistent pain uh, that is suspicious for dissection, they need to seek immediate medical attention, either by calling 911 or going to the emergency room. And once there, the patient or their loved one needs to be able to convey to the emergency team that they have Marfan syndrome, that they're at a high risk for aortic dissection, and that they need imaging immediately in order to rule this out. Severe chest pain, particularly in children and young adults, tends to be very easily written off by the ER as either heartburn or musculoskeletal pain. So it really is critically important for patients and their families to be able to strongly advocate for themselves because not every ER will know about Marfan syndrome. And I, I do want to mention that temporary sporadic chest pain is very common in growing children. So I don't want families to start to worry about every single chest pain that pops, pops up. Uh, but it's really important to be aware of whether the pain is ongoing versus gone after a few seconds or minutes. And if the pain ever lasts for an extended period of time, it's better to be safe and get checked out. I also wanted to point out that there are a lot of helpful tools that we encourage our patients to keep at the ready for an emergency, including medical alert bracelets and emergency alert cards. Um, this is a really helpful card that you can print off directly from the Marfan Foundation's website, and it's intended to be given to ER doctors for instructions on what should be done for a patient with Marfan syndrome. And I, I'm always a big proponent that the more tools that you have that can help you better advocate for yourself or your child, the better. Uh, one final important topic that we review, particularly with our newly diagnosed patients, is to avoid using fluoroquinolones, which is a very specific class of antibiotic. So in 2018, the FDA released a warning that stated uh, that this class of antibiotics was associated with an increased risk for dissection in the general population. And because of that, they decided to warn against the use of these medications in individuals with additional risk factors for dissection, including um, genetic uh, aortic conditions like Marfan syndrome. And instead, they recommended using a type of antibiotic, uh, a different type of antibiotic, unless no other medical medication will fight the infection. So examples of commonly used fluoroquinolones include ciprofloxacin, levaquin, ofloxacin. Um, all of these are frequently used to treat UTIs, pneumonias, and other common infections in adults. And one helpful recommendation that we have is to list fluoroquinolones as an allergy with any doctor's office or hospital system. And this should help trigger the, the prescribing doctor um, to perhaps consider a, an alternative before prescribing a fluoroquinolone. So as I wrap up the cardiac management section, I wanted to introduce you to our wonderful cardiovascular genetics aortopathy team at Texas Children's Hospital. We specialize in diagnosing and managing patients with Marfan syndrome. In addition to our two pediatric cardiologists, Drs. Justin Wigand and Shane Morris, we have a physician assistant, Ben, and nurse practitioner, Josie, who have uh, really helped improve our ability to see patients with rapid availability. And new to the team in 2022, we have a wonderful adult cardiologist, Dr. Katie Salsicholi. Uh, we transfer our uh, patients to her once they become adults, or we have also referred our parents if they also get diagnosed with Marfan syndrome. We also have two genetic counselors, including Emily Salucek and myself, and we both see patients in the pediatric and adult settings. And then our nurse coordinator, Des, is fabulous at helping our newly referred patients have a smooth experience getting scheduled with our team for an appointment. And Leslie and Diane are, are fantastic administrative staff. And one thing I, I always like to point out about our team is that truly once you've established your cardiac or cardiology management with our team at Texas Children's Hospital, we can be your medical home for life because we can follow you on the pediatric and the adult side. 
So the last part of my talk is going to focus on some exciting research updates in the Marfan community, highlighting some of our research endeavors here at Texas Children's. So the first research topic is related to exercise in Marfan syndrome, which has become a really hot topic in current research. So in general, we know that children with Marfan uh, tend to be less physically active. Some studies have shown that they only have 63% of normal oxygen uptake, um, which sometimes you'll hear referred to as VO2 max. Um, and this is just the amount of oxygen that the body can absorb during exercise. So a higher oxygen uptake is a sign of better aerobic fitness, while a low oxygen uptake is associated with poor aerobic fitness. And children with Marfan syndrome tend to have less aerobic fitness than their peers, and they also tend to have less muscle strength than their peers. And it's believed that this is likely the result of very strict activity restrictions put on them by their cardiologists, who, as you can imagine, are, are really just trying to keep their patients safe. But being overly restricted is an understandable source of frustration for patients and parents, especially when they do want to be more physically active. So taking a few steps back to some research from a few years ago, before this boom in exercise research, there was an initial study published back in 2017, which found that in mice with Marfan syndrome, both mild and moderate levels of uh, exercise actually decreased the rates of aortic dilation. So it had a protective effect on the, on the rate of aortic growth. And then in that same study, mice who were either sedentary with no exercise or subjective to very intense exercise levels, those showed the fastest rates of aortic dilation. However, this study was in mice and there really have been no controlled studies to evaluate the effects of exercise, at different levels of exercise on the rate of aortic dilation or the risk of dissection in humans with Marfan syndrome. Fortunately, in August of this year, the Marfan Foundation um, hosted a international scientific meeting called Science in Paris, where world experts met to talk about critical research updates. And at that meeting, five pilot studies were presented, which all suggested that mild to moderate exercise is safe and beneficial in people with Marfan syndrome and related connective tissue disorders. In fact, one of those studies was conducted by my colleague, Dr. Shane Morse, in our research team here at Texas Children's Hospital. So this was funded by a research grant from the Marfan Foundation. And the goal of our exercise trial is to examine the effects of a personalized, moderate intensity exercise routine on um, MRI findings, exercise capacity, and blood pressure in teenagers with Marfan syndrome. So each of our teens, we had about 20, was provided with a Fitbit, some basic home exercise equipment, and a, a personalized exercise routine, which included about 150 minutes of exercise per week with sessions guided by a physical therapist. And the data presented on, on the next slide is from the midpoint uh, of this ongoing study. So we collected data um, with, uh, that included a cardiac MRI to measure the aortic root size, an exercise stress test on, an, on a treadmill to measure the oxygen uptake, and then blood pressure measurements. And all of these data points were collected both at an initial visit, as well as the follow-up visit four months after four months of exercise. So on these graphs, time point one is the initial visit and time point two is the follow-up visit after four months of exercise. Each line represents one of our participants. And the first graph shows that the participants, uh, shows our participants aortic root size in centimeters. And we did not see any significant changes and, and perhaps more importantly, no large jumps in the aortic root size, despite the fact that these are growing children. So we do expect some growth. The second graph shows VO2 max, or again, the oxygen uptake. And as you can see, that was significantly improved um, among most of our participants, with show some showing a, a lot greater improvement than others. And as a reminder, this increased oxygen uptake is a sign of improved aerobic fitness. The third graph on the right shows systolic blood pressure measurements and um, shows us that blood pressure was significantly decreased in all but one patient. And decreasing blood pressure is already a known positive impact of exercise on the body, but as you can imagine, a decreased blood pressure causing decreased stress on the aorta could be particularly important in patients with Marfan syndrome. 
So these were really encouraging preliminary data on the benefits of mild to moderate exercise in teens with Marfan syndrome. So we've gotten more funding uh, to expand this study to include more st study participants with the hope of extending the study to other participating centers. So keep an eye on the horizon for more data to come in the realm of exercise in Marfan syndrome, and not just out of Texas Children's Hospital, but out of several centers worldwide. The next major area of research that our group focused on involves a very rare type of Marfan syndrome called early onset Marfan syndrome. And historically, this has also been called infantile or neonatal Marfan syndrome. This is the most severe form of Marfan syndrome, and it's known to be caused by pathogenic variants in a very specific region of that FBN1 gene. And this type of Marfan is characterized by extremely severe heart disease within the very first year of life. Um, the most life-threatening of which um, is actually from severe mitral valve prolapse and very severe leakiness at that mitral valve that can cause congestive heart failure. And then although it's not usually life-threatening in the first year, we do see severe aortic dilation in these patients. Um, and we can also uh, see very striking physical features right from birth, including extremely long fingers and toes, stiffening of the joints, very low muscle tone, and a prematurely aged appearance. So the current literature on early onset Marfan syndrome suggests a very grim and, and really poor prognosis for these children, estimating a life expectancy less than two years of age. However, based on our experience at Texas Children's and other large institutions, we, we started to realize that this data was really outdated, um, probably due to the, the rarity of this form of Marfan syndrome. So there's a, a, a big lack of up-to-date data on the current rates of survival. So I'm currently working with Dr. Morris on her project to, to develop a, a brand new research collaborative for aortic disease that includes over 30 participating hospitals around the United States and Canada. And so this was our very first project with uh, the collaborative to analyze a, a, a large cohort of patients with early onset Marfan syndrome. And so um, this data is what we presented at Science in Paris in August. It's our preliminary data. And so we are very excited to report that in our research that um, our patients with early onset Marfan syndrome, uh, their median age is currently 6.2 years with ages ranging all the way from infancy um, all the way out to an adult who's currently 21. And it's, it's illustrated by our survival curve here on the right, um, the, the, the level of survivability that we're seeing in these patients versus what we used to see, which is only to the age of two. Um, and this is su suggesting that the, the survival in these patients is much better than previously reported. And then we also had, uh, or we're, we're thinking that the reason for this is uh, because of the higher rates of successful mitral and aortic surgery. Again, this is just preliminary data from our study, and we're working to add additional patients and hopefully uh, publish a full manuscript sometime within the next year. And this brings me to my last important research update, the new research collaborative being developed by Dr. Morris and her team here at TCH in conjunction uh, with those 30 other hospitals um, and counting. This, so this project is called CLARITY, uh, which stands for the Collaborative for Longitudinal, Longitudinal Aortic Imaging in the Young. And CLARITY was created because there are currently no guidelines on how to manage aortic dilation in children. These guidelines really only exist for adults. Um, so this collaborative aims to create the world's largest online database for children and young adults with genetic aortic conditions, with the goal of creating better tools uh, to help us diagnose, uh, stratify risk, and and treat our patients. So all individuals with Marfan syndrome are currently eligible to enroll and participation is, is, is really easy. Essentially, just with your permission, we collect information from your medical records that's related to your diagnosis and enter that information into a secure database. And from there, our researchers can analyze that data, data and help contribute to our research goals. So if you're interested in participating, uh, feel free to reach out to me on my email that I'll list on the last slide here um, and, and let me know. Uh, as I wrap things up here, I wanted to include two brief slides that I think are probably the most important slides to keep in mind from tonight's talk. 
Uh, if you have never heard of or have never been involved with the Marfan Foundation, I wanted to introduce you to, uh, to them as one of the most incredible patient advocacy organizations that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. They're an organization that's focused on providing reliable education, up-to-date information, research funding, and social support for families impacted by Marfan syndrome. And they're really inclusive of other related conditions like Lowy Steep syndrome, vascular Ehlers Danlos syndrome, and other genetic aortic conditions. They offer really awesome virtual support groups and mentorship programs. So here on the right, I've included the, their calendar of uh, events and, and support groups from just from this November. One thing I didn't realize they had are things like team game night, which I thought was really cool. Uh, they also host ongoing educational webinars from top experts in the field of genetic aortic disease, as well as local fundraising and advocacy events here in Houston. And then they offer national and international meetings for families, as well as summer camps for, for children and families. And if you want to check out more of what they have to offer, their website is just marfan.org. So these are two upcoming events, which are very near and dear to my heart, including the annual Houston Walk for Victory, which will be on uh, Saturday, March 11th next year at Discovery Green in downtown Houston. And this is a, a fantastic way to connect and, and, and really get out and have fun with some other families impacted by Marfan syndrome um, and related conditions here in the Houston area. And it also gives us an opportunity to raise money for a really great cause. We do have a Texas Children's booth there every year, and we'd really love to see you out there. And then uh, probably my favorite event of the entire year, I always call it my uh, own version of Christmas in July, is the annual E3 conference, uh, which is a family conference hosted by the Marfan Foundation every summer. And if you've never been to it, it starts out with a health fair for families that want to meet with world experts that they might not otherwise get to see. And then the last two days of conference include educational seminars for for parents and then fun activities and field trips trips for children and teens and then a lot of different social events so that you can connect with other people and then the the very last thing i wanted to mention is if you were interested in the exercise data that i was talking about out of texas children's hospital there is actually a, a webinar last week uh, from the marfan foundation uh, on this very subject where they went over all of the studies from science in paris that went into physical activity uh, and you can find that webinar actually on the Marfan Foundation's website, as well as their YouTube channel. And with that, I wanted to thank you all so much for your attention, and I'm really excited to pass it back over to Amanda um, and uh, Mandy Shaw. Great. Thank you so much, Taylor. If anybody has questions for Taylor, feel free to um, start putting those in the Q&A. Um, but for now, I will turn it over to Mandy. Hello everyone, my name is Mandy Shaw and I am very familiar with Marfan syndrome from a completely different perspective. Um, I first met my husband in 2005 and on our very first date I learned more than I ever wanted to know about what Marfan syndrome was and um, how he had been affected. My husband had a pretty significant case of Marfan syndrome. Um, he had ha already had scoliosis surgery as a teenager. He had had pectus excavatum surgery as a child. Um, he had mitral valve prolapse that was very pronounced. Like you could hear the whoosh if you listened really closely to his heart, um, as well as an enlarged aorta as well. Um, back at the time that he was a child, there wasn't as much information out there about what Marfan syndrome was and how do you get diagnosed and all of the information for it. Um, I don't remember exactly what he had been told about genetic testing, but my understanding was to confirm it through testing. It would have been an invasive procedure. So um, they went on the cardiologist recommendation and never had anything to confirm, you know, that it was in fact Marfan syndrome and not any other kind of connective tissue um, disorder. And um, for the most part, he was um, the life of the party and you know, stranger and an awesome guy. Um, in 2009, we got married, and then in 2010, he had open heart surgery to repair his mitral valve. We were very fortunate. Um, the initial plan was to re replace it, um, but the, card the surgeon that went in um, decided to go ahead and repair it, so surgery was a little bit longer than we anticipated and made it a little scarier, um, but did a great job repairing his mitral valve. Even the anesthesiologist came out and was like, if any other surgeon had been in there, that wouldn't have been repaired. So we were really thankful. Um, recovery was a lot 
more difficult than we anticipated that it was going to be. We thought he would be in and out of the hospital really in a couple of days. Instead, he was in ICU for five days before he got moved to a regular floor. Um, and, and with that kind of came the the pieces of Marfan syndrome that really don't get talked about a lot about the anxiety and the stress that came with the diagnosis and having a chronic illness that was affecting his everyday life. Um, so we, we dealt with that and started going on for the first year after that was the first year that he had had no medical emergencies or any kind of crazy health things going on. Everything was pretty stable. Um, and then things kind of started changing a little bit. Um, and in 2013, we welcomed twins, um, boy, girl, Madison and Michael. Um, they are nine and a half now. Um, but when they were four months old, um, he passed away. And um, at that time, we knew our risk of having children with Marfan syndrome would be 50%. Um, we had a really good pediatrician at the time who had examined both kids and listened really intently to their heart. And she was familiar about Marfan syndrome. And we really didn't think either child had it. Um, but after he passed away, his um, cardiologist reached out and was like, you know, at any time you want to bring them in, have official testing, just to be sure, just let me know. Um, I pushed that off for a long time, um, just dealing with my own grief and not having my husband here and raising two children by myself. Um, and in 2016, I was really introduced to the Marfan Foundation. I knew it existed. We had seen things about conference before, but there wasn't a lot of information out there. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know if it was any good. We just didn't pay attention. Um, but we had donated before. So all of a sudden we got a flyer in the mail that said, hey, we're having our first walk for victory in Houston. Come. And so I thought that would be a really great way to honor my husband and walk in his memory. So I grabbed all my friends and family and we came out to the very first walk um, with shirts that said in memory of, of him. And we met some amazing people that day. Um, it was the first time that I honestly I felt some relief like there were other people that got it um and even then my son hadn't been diagnosed yet um but it was it was a really exciting day and I didn't really know what was going to come from that but we had a great time that day um six months later I did take my kids in to get checked out by my husband's cardiologist and um, he confirmed that my son had Marfan syndrome and my daughter did not we still didn't do genetic testing, but his aorta was enlarged. So we got the diagnosis that way and started medication immediately. Um, about six months later, we moved from Austin to Houston. And so we I had heard enough about Dr. Morris to know that that's where I wanted my son to go. But um, her wait list was a tad lengthy. And so we went to the next follow-up with my, the previous cardiologist and he was like, okay, we'll see you, but you've got to find somebody closer to you. And so I got on the wait list to see Dr. Morris, um, saw her for the very first time about a year after the first diagnosis. And um, honestly, she's probably the best doctor I've ever seen for any reason and anyone in my family that I've gone. She's just a great doctor that really listens to what you have to say. Um, educates you in a way that isn't all the medical terms that are, you know, scary and everything else. And um, my son also has ADHD. So he takes ADHD medication, which um, can make him not have an appetite at times. So we've struggled with gaining weight. And since we want children with Marfan syndrome to grow into their aorta, he needs to gain weight in order to gain you know, grow into his aorta. And so we've struggled and he's had some very scary Z scores. Um, I went and checked a little bit ago and his last Z score was 4.5. So we've had some scary appointments, but I remember the appointment before the last one. Um, she had some students in her office that came in to talk to me first, which is fine, but you know, they don't know me or my family. And so I was already nervous. And then they gave me a Z score of 4.9 and I nearly fell out of my chair and was crying and I was very scared. And um, Dr. Morris immediately came in, was like, we're good. Like, we're good. There's nothing. We're not freaking out. That's today's not a freak out appointment. We're not going to do that. 
And so she quickly made adjustments to medication that have proven to be effective at this point. We see her actually in two weeks to make sure that things are still going well. Um, but that that has been a, a great experience getting to know her. Um, also the Marfan Foundation, we've participated in every single Walk for Victory since 2016. I've met so many different families um, that have children that have Marfan syndrome, that have siblings that have Marfan syndrome, just getting to know them and what their life has been like. There is really no other relief than meeting another mom who understands what it's like to go into a doctor's appointment, not really knowing what news you're going to get today. And that having to do that every six months, like that's scary. And I now have a whole family of people that I would have never known before that on those days that I can check in and talk with them and they really understand what those appointments are like. Um, also, the foundation has just been a fantas fantastic support for my family and I know so many others. Um, we participated in our first conference um, in Houston in 2019. Um, I think I spent the entire last day just crying because I was just so overwhelmed with all the knowledge, all the experience, all the expertise of people in the field of people that take care of kids like mine and other people that had experienced things like we had experienced. Um, it's, it's just not something I would be able to experience in any other place. Um, we... I remember my my daughter um, doesn't have Marfan syndrome, but actually has seen a geneticist for a different rare genetic disorder, way more rare than Marfan syndrome. And there is like three research articles on it at all. There's very little information. And so while we were thankful to get the diagnosis, I left that appointment still feeling very defeated because I didn't have any more information. And I posted on social media and within an hour, someone from the Marfan Foundation had called me and reached out to another doctor and provided me with the three articles that that doctor had found on that disorder that my daughter had. And I know that, that I'm not the only one. I'm not so special that it was just my family. They've done that for a lot of other people. The resources they have, um, the things that they bring to the table to make sure that those with Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue, tissue disorders are not being overlooked. They're getting the care that they need and they deserve. Um, is so overwhelmingly positive that it's just been um, a great experience for me to know and be a part of that organization. Um, so I think that's all, unless anyone has any questions. We have had a couple of questions come in for both speakers. If people have more questions, um, feel free to be sending those in, but I'll go ahead and ask the first couple that have come through. Um, so we have one that I think is more for Taylor. Um, so somebody wrote in, um, I haven't had problems. I have not had problems with my eyes and I'm now past the age of 50. I've heard that the lenses in the eyes usually dislocate in childhood. Does this mean that I do not need to worry about having this problem? That's a, a really good question. And I definitely can't claim to be the expert, uh, as it relates to the eyes in Marfan syndrome. But from, from what I do understand is that there is, um, you know, overall, all a lifetime increased risk to have lens dis dislocation. So even if you don't develop it um, without having sort of any traumatic event, you're at a higher risk for it. Say if you're in like a car accident or get hit or struck in the face in some way, just because the connective tissue um, isn't at, it's, it's a lot more fragile in Marfan syndrome. So I, I don't want to say that just that because you've made it to a certain age doesn't mean you will ever develop it. It could mean that you're less likely to develop it if you haven't already, but certainly just because of the fragile tissue, you may be more likely to get it um, with some, especially with some sort of traumatic injury. All right, thank you. Um, we had another message come in that said, great presentations. Um, and then I think this really can be for either of you guys. Um, what resources do you recommend for families to take to school nurses for their students who have Marfan syndrome? I would love to know what, what Mandy uses. Yeah, so on the Marfan Foundation website, there is a page or a packet really that says 
um, it's resources for teachers and there's resources for the school nurse. I print both. Um, I've been fortunate that my child's nurse has been basically the same since he started school. So I've not had to give that every year. But the very first year I printed it and I highlighted all the information that was incredibly relevant to my child because um, currently he doesn't have any eye concerns. He's checked annually, but there's nothing implying that there's any issue. So like I would skip over that other than to make sure that he's not getting hit in the face. And if he's hit in the face, that he needs to be checked out by the nurse and they should call me. But I highlight the things that are relevant and I give that to them. For teachers, I do the same thing every year for every single teacher that he has. I print the resource and highlight the important information. And I also do like an about me. I put his name in big, pretty letters at the top with a picture of him. And then just a little bit of information about who he is, how he functions, what the concerns should be to kind of recap. You know, Marfan syndrome has so, so many pieces of it. I wanna know if he has any kind of breathing struggles, he needs to see the nurse. If he complains of pain, he needs to see the nurse. If he gets hit or knocked down or anything that's significant that may have caused him to whimper or cry, he needs to go see the nurse. And just letting the teacher know that and in a way, dumbing down the medical stuff just so that they know what to look for of their 20 ever however many kids and give that to them and so far that's been really well received um this year actually his teacher said I don't know why I don't get this for every kid I really wish I had it for every kid and so I think it works really well um we just had another question come in um it says you may have answered this but does a basic physical catch this in a child before they join a sports team that's a tough one to answer. I would say uh, the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. So um, in a person, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that some people with Marfan syndrome are more mildly affected, especially from a physical characteristic standpoint, and other people are more severely affected. So if you, if you have a pediatrician that's doing a physical exam um, and, or like a routine physical and the person is very mildly affected, it's probably going to take someone with very astute eye to realize, hey, you know, maybe this person's a little taller than we would expect them to be if if their parents are um, uh, not as tall as the child is. Um, but someone who's more severely affected should be a little bit more obvious uh, to a pediatrician. And um, I think the the two things that we can never find from just a basic physical is we can never have uh, ultrasound images of the heart in, in a basic physical, and we can't have, we usually don't have genetic testing. And so to really get a really detailed look, you're going to want to meet either with a genetics team and or a cardiology team to get those more in-depth findings. But hopefully, I'm hoping that pediatricians out there um, are aware of the more obvious signs and symptoms of Marfan syndrome. Um, we've had one more message come in, not a question, um, but it's from John Belmont. Um, it says, this is one of the most accessible presentations on Marfan syndrome that I have ever seen and beautifully done. So thank you both for that. Um, and I agree. Um, those are all the questions we have for right now, but I actually have one question. Um, and if anybody would like to send more, feel free to do so. Um, so mine is for Mandy. Um, we don't, I work in the general genetics clinic at Texas Children's. Um, and we see a lot of patients for Marfan syndrome kind of initially, and then send them over to Taylor's team for, um, management from there. Um, but we have a lot of patient families, both with Marfan syndrome and with other many other conditions that we see in the clinic who um, have a lot of questions and struggle with um, when and how to talk to their child about their diagnosis or kind of disclose that to them and, and how to discuss that with them and, and their siblings if they have them. Um, so I was just wondering if you would be willing to share just a little bit about how that journey kind of went for you and how you've handled that. Yeah, so in the beginning, my son was three when he was diagnosed, and my daughter was five when she was diagnosed with her genetic disorder. So they're both really young. Um, I don't really know that I went into a lot of detail at that point because I don't think they would have understood, but kind of as they've gotten older, um, the biggest thing for my son was I was able to explain that his heart worked differently than other people's hearts. And so because of that, he may need to be more careful than other kids his age. Um, so that's how I, I explained away sports and things like that. 
So with the restrictions, I didn't allow him to play some of the t-ball and fun things that little kids get to do because I didn't want him to play sports that maybe he would develop a passion for that would have to be taken away later. Um, but as he got a little bit older, he really wanted to play soccer. And so we did soccer with the YMCA with the understanding that we got to play one time, but then we wouldn't be able to play again because our heart was different. Um, and that has worked. And as he's gotten older, we talk a little bit more. Right now, the biggest struggle is um, like fatigue in his lig ligaments. So handwriting is a big time struggle. Plus he has ADHD. So he's got to focus on that pain in his hand to write. And so we're talking about trying to advocate for himself. He has an IEP in place at school and just being able to advocate to say, hey, my hand is really hurting me because I have Marfan syndrome. I need to take a break. And so um, just reminding him that, you know, he has something that is beyond his control and it's okay to ask for help from sometimes. Um, and I just think keeping it simple, just really simple. I don't, he doesn't know all the details of my husband's health and he will eventually, but not right now he doesn't know all the scary things that could go wrong um i'm not sure he entirely he know sure knows why i've cried in some cardiology appointments and i don't think that that's important until it's like a need to know kind of thing um we've had another question come in um i think for for anyone who'd like to answer it um what do you feel are the biggest obstacles to genetic testing for marfan syndrome and other aortopathies yeah, I, I think from a, a clinical perspective, historically, one of the biggest obstacles was just the cost of genetic testing um, and poor insurance coverage. Um, but I, I will mention that, especially in, in the last several years, the, the cost and accessibility of genetic testing has dramatically improved. Um, so we've really been able to offer genetic testing more frequently, and we have a much higher success rate with getting genetic testing covered by insurance companies. Um, especially now, at least from the cardiology perspective, now that we have genetic counselors on staff to kind of help get that sort of testing approved and walk families through through that whole process if there's any insurance hiccups along the way. And another thing that's really kind of helped combat insurance issues is that um, there are also uh, genetic testing laboratories that offer uh, genetic testing for out-of-pocket cash option where you bypass insurance. And for families who cost maybe uh, an issue, they some of the laboratories offer patient assistance program where, they're, where they will bring down the cost of testing uh, based on the, the family's income level if they're willing to share that information with the laboratory. So I would say the, the accessibility isn't perfect yet, but it definitely has dramatically improved um, in recent years. Um, we had another um, kind of more technical question um, about whether there will be a video of tonight's webinar available later um, for viewing. I believe the answer to that is yes. Okay, yes, Gladys says yes. Um, and I think it goes on the Evenings with Genetics website, which Gladys just shared the link for in the chat. Um, so the video will be there shortly if you um, are looking for that later. I'm going to put my email in the chat really quick for anyone that wants to contact me with any questions, either about information that was on my slides or about the research um, that I was talking about. So I'm sending that in right now. And can I add, if you have Marfan syndrome or a family affected, we do have a Facebook page for Texas, but there are oh, other great. states um, involved. And then there's a main Marfan syndrome page on Facebook um, that you can find. And I admin the Texas page. So if you have any questions, you can message me. The walk that Taylor posted for March, at minimum, it's a such a fun day. It's my son's favorite day of the year. There's face painting, there's snacks, there's free Chick-fil-A. It's and the walk is really not much of a walk. It's a little circle around the park, but it's a great day. It's a good place to come connect to see if it's something you want to be involved in. And I promise you'll have a good time. We do have um, the link to the Marfan Syndrome Foundation, um, the Marfan Foundation in the chat. Um, we also have the link to this presentation if people want to view that later on. Um, and I believe a little bit further up, we also have a post um, event survey if people are able to complete that. And I see that um, listed up here and the QR code as well. Um, so please complete that and feel free to share ideas if you have any for future seminars. 
Um, and with that, I think we are all done. So thank you so much, Taylor and Mandy, for um, sharing your time and your information with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye.